well. Good evening. Let's try that again. Good evening. Well, we've got, I think, almost as many people on the platform as we have in the, the, the audience. Glad you mentioned that. Um, Pastor is at a funeral for Brother Siler's daughter. He preached that at 2 o'clock this afternoon in the graveside. Where would you say it was, Rex? Barberville. So he's, they're way, they're way out there. But uh, So he asked me to handle the service tonight for him. I told him I would. I think I could handle that. So let's go ahead and open the service in a word of prayer, and we'll jump right in. Lord, I do thank you for the freedom and the opportunity that we have to be in your house, Lord, for the just the sweet spirit that's here, Lord, I pray that everyone that's here would um, get a blessing out of the service tonight, Lord, that um, we would enter in together, and uh, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would have free reign tonight to do what only the Holy Spirit can do, Lord, from the first prayer to the last amen, we ask that your name would be honored and glorified, for it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, if you will, go ahead and stand, we're going to sing a couple songs, and the choir's going to sing, and just kind of go about our normal our normal service this evening. Blessed be the name, all praise to him who reigns above. Blessed be the name. All praise to him who reigns above. His majesty supreme. assurance Jesus is mine. How many of you are familiar with the story of Fanny Crosby? You've heard her story. Fanny Crosby, who wrote a lot of the hymns that we sing, when she was born had an issue with her eyes and the doctors put a hot compress on her eyes and blinded her from birth went through her whole life not being able to see, but loved the Lord. If you look through our hymn book, there's a, I believe, I could be wrong, but a lot of times there's an author or an um, index in the back that lists what, who wrote what songs. You'll see if you look through that, Fanny Crosby wrote a lot of the songs that we sing. And this is probably one of my favorites, Blessed Assurance. She says in the second verse, and we'll sing it here in a minute, but she says, Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Now keep in mind, she had never seen anything in her entire life. And she's writing about visions of rapture. She also wrote a song called My Savior First of All, and she writes about when she gets to heaven, who she's going to see first, and she's going to see Jesus first. The first thing her eyes are going to see is Lord Jesus Christ. So as we sing the song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, I want you to remember, she couldn't see. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washing His blood, this is 
is going to sing for us a song now titled Little by Little. It's just a short little chorus. I want you to pay attention and listen as they sing it because here in the next couple of weeks probably we'll start teaching it to you all. That way you can use it as a chorus and sing along with the choir. <laughs> who you used to be. Well, if you've got a bulletin there, just a few announcements we went over this morning. Just a reminder tonight. If this will pull it up for me. All right. Well, we're done with June. I mean, done with May. Almost done with June. We hadn't even started. We're almost done with June. We are done with the month of May. This year has just flown by so quickly. Of course, I say that every year it flies by. Coming up in June, we've got Men on the Mountain, June 8th through the 10th up in Hazard, Kentucky. I always am concerned about going somewhere called Hazard, but from, from what I've heard, it's, it's, a, it's a great place. and Everybody has a good time. But men and uh, anybody that's, that's able to, to go up for that, I know you'll get a blessing out of that in Hazard, June 8th through the 10th. Then June the 11th, Sunday afternoon, we're going to have a baptizing at the river. It's always special when we have a baptism, whether it's here or down by the river. I think since I've been here, I've been to two or three. And it's just a kind of a dis- different atmosphere. Um, that'll be Sunday afternoon after the morning service. And if you're not familiar with where it's at, if you go up like you're going to Harrogate, right after you cross River Bridge, take a left. And then you're going to take another left onto a gravel, a gravel road. You won't be able to miss it because you'll see all the cars that are there. Then we also have coming up in June, Father's Day is June the 18th. So mark, make sure you've got that marked on your calendar. June 21st is our monthly men's fellowship. That'll be on Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock right here in the church. If your schedule permits that and you can be here, um, 
heard a lot of good a lot of good comments that come out of that men's meeting. There's a sign up sheet on the foyer table. Um, you can sign up. That'll give everybody because I'm pretty sure they have food. Am I right? Do they have food? I mean, you can't have a men's meeting without having food. Lydia Ladies this month will be on June the 22nd. That's Thursday evening at 6.30. The details will be in next week's bulletin. Um, so keep your eye out for that. And then our church anniversary, June the 25th. That will be a special Sunday celebrating 16 years of Twin City Baptist Church being a ministry here in Haslam and Tazewell Claiborne County. So that's a huge, a huge milestone. All right, men, if you will come up, we'll go ahead and take an offering this evening. All right, well, let's, let's pray for the offering. Lord, we do come to you again, Lord, asking you that you would take this offering, Lord, that you would multiply it. Lord, as, as the little boy that brought his five loaves and two fishes, Lord, you took what he had and you did so much more with it. Lord, we pray that you take this offering, you would bless it, bless the giver, and uh, Lord, may it go to further the ministry that we have here at Twin City Baptist Church. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I turn myself off. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. What a wonderful song. Thank you, Miss Rachel. Kelly's going to sing for us right before I come up and preach. So pray for her as she sings.
Sometimes we think he makes mistakes. Sometimes when he doesn't work on times that we think he should work on, Lord, are you making a mistake here? Like Kelly said, God makes no mistakes. He's perfect. He's the only one that ever was perfect. Well, I have more time on the clock than what I can fill. At least I think I do, unless that clock is wrong. So we may get out of here early tonight. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Psalm chapter number one. If you will take your Bible there, turn to Psalm chapter number one. I had no idea the pastor was going to be preaching out of Psalm chapter 11 this morning. And uh, he, uh, he sent me a text on Friday. He said, hey, can you preach for me Sunday night? I know it's kind of short notice. He's like, but I've got to, I've got to be out to, to be at a funeral. I was like, sure, I'll preach. So I immediately began to, to pray and ask God to lead me where he would have me. And uh, through a, a conversation with Brother David Dunham, who's not here, pray for him. And he's got a lot on his plate. I know he wouldn't want me to say anything, but just pray pray for him. But we were having a conversation, and uh, we got to talking about Psalm chapter 1. And uh, the Lord just landed me there. So we're going we're gonna to dig in here, Psalm chapter number 1, and talk about blessed. What does it mean to be blessed? Let's pray. Lord, I do thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house. Lord, among your people, pray that as we look in your word tonight that you would help us. Lord, that you'd encourage us, that uh, we would walk away from here with something that can change our lives. We ask this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Psalm chapter number one. The Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The first word of this chapter, the first word of the entire book of Psalms is the word blessed or blessed. We, a lot of times, will use the word blessed or blessing or the phrase bless his heart or bless your heart or bless her heart. You know, we'll use those in in certain ways. And uh, I think we've kind of lost what it truly means to be blessed. Um, I almost had, you know, a time where we could, everybody could just, you know, anybody that wanted to could, could share a blessing with us or, you know, something, somehow you were blessed this week. Um, but a lot of times we equate that to be just something something good that happened to us, which is not wrong. But there's more to being blessed than just having something good done for you. Um, that is a blessing. But Psalms chapter 1 digs in a little bit deeper than, than that. Through the centuries, the book of Psalms has been probably a favorite part of the Bible. How many of you in here would say the book of Psalms is probably one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, or favorite books in the Bible? I'd say a lot of us, whether it's your absolute favorite or one of your favorites, a lot of us can find something in the book of Psalms that relates to us or speaks to us. Um, It's very relatable. David, when he wrote a lot of these, he was very relatable. In virtually every situation of life, People have found help in its pages, whether it's in trials, whether it's when someone's struggling with with a sin in their life. Um, 
public and private worship, prayer, doubt, praise, even thanksgiving, all of those topics are handled in the book of Psalms. You ever feel discouraged? Turn to the book of Psalms. You ever doubt God's love? Turn to the book of Psalms. Psalms focuses on God and humanity and their connection with one another. David, though though he sinned, like all of us do, David was known as a man after God's own heart. David knew what it meant to follow God. Did he always follow God? Again, no, he didn't. But the one thing David did have was he was a quick repenter. When he failed, when he messed up, when he made a mistake, he was right there to quick say, God, forgive me. Please forgive me. I've heard preachers say this, keep short accounts with God. Psalms reveals much about God and his relationship with us. And we find here in Psalms chapter 1 that it's a book of instruction. It's instruction concerning good and evil, setting before us life and death, blessing and the curse. It also guides us so that we can take the right way which leads to happiness and avoid the path that will certainly end in misery and ruin. So let's look at what it means to be blessed. The first thing I want us to see is the character of of a blessed person. The character of a blessed person. David starts, he says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. The first thing that we see about someone that's blessed is they stay away or they distance themselves from worldly counsel. They distance themselves from world, And we all know The world is there to give counsel. They love to give their opinion. Those in the world, they have the solution. They have the answer. And if we'll listen, they'll freely give it. I know with with children, my wife and I have always said, we want to be the ones to teach our children about certain topics because if we don't, the world will. If we don't, the world will, and that's the, that's true in in so many so many cases, so many topics, so many things. That if we don't take the initiative and give them the correct response or the correct answer, the correct teaching, the world will give their counsel. The world will give their solution or their thought or their their idea on the topic, and that can range from many many things. You know, creation versus evolution. There's all kinds of different topics that the world would love to give their their solution on. But the character of a blessed person is they distance themselves from worldly counsel. We see here a progression in this first verse. David says first, he walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. To walk is to follow after the advice of something that's morally wrong. That's basically what that walking in the counsel of the ungodly is walking or following after counsel of someone that is morally wrong. Morally wrong. So he goes from walking. The next thing we see is standing. Not only is he walking in the counsel of the ungodly, but now he's, he's standing in the way of sinners. That means to, to stand or to dwell in the course of, of life or mode of action of one that is guilty of sin, someone that's separated from God. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. We've all sinned. We've all made choices in our life that would put us in the classification of a sinner. My, my dad always says this. He's like, I will never put a bumper sticker on my car. He says, but if I did put a bumper sticker, it would say, I'm not perfect, but I'm forgiven. And that's what separates us. That's the difference between a lost person and a saved person. We're not perfect, but we are forgiven. And, and, and David says here, he says, 
A blessed person does not stand in the way of sinners. A blessed person does not dwell in the course of life or mode of action of one that is guilty, a sinner. We are to be different for a reason. We're to live our lives in a different way than, than someone in the world. We're not supposed to go places they go. We're not supposed to do things they do. We're not supposed to say things they say. There's that song, you know, the things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. There's been a great change. The things I used to do, the things I used to say, the places I used to go, there needs to be, there needs to be a difference. The blessed person does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. They don't stand in the way of sinners. But here's the next progression. You go from walking to standing to now you're sitting. Sitting in the seat of the scornful. That means to sit or remain in the seat or the assembly of someone that mouths off or mocks them. How do you like to be around a scorner? Someone that's constantly making fun of other people. Somebody that I guess another way to put it, maybe a know-it-all. They know everything. They've, been, they've, they've done it all. And you may be telling a story about something you did, and boom, they've got a story that one-ups everything you just said. I listened to a comedian one time, and he said that, that uh, he didn't like to go to dinner parties with know-it-alls because you run into to what he called a me monster. You could tell them a story about something great you had done, and they're like, well, I did this and I did this. He's like, I would have loved to have been one of the astronauts that walked on the moon. Because then you could go wherever you want and no matter what anybody says, they could try to one-up you and all you had to do was say, I walked on the moon. I mean, can't really one-up that, can you? All that to say, none of us like to be in the company of someone that mouths off or is scornful but we find here, in, in contrast, because Psalms will con- does a lot of contrast, a person that's not blessed will find themselves sitting with that type of a person. They distance themselves from worldly counsel. They go from walking to standing to sitting. We are in the world. How many of you would agree with that? Last time I checked, we're in the world. We're not dreamers in the shadows. But we live in this world. We work, we live, we play, we shop. We're in the world. And the world needs us, believe it or not. The world needs us. We are, Jesus said we are to be the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. We're here for a reason. God's left us here for a reason. If he didn't have a reason for us to be here, the moment we were saved, boom, we'd be in heaven but we're not. Those of us that are saved, they're in this room. If you're saved, God has you here for a reason. The world needs us. Our workplaces need us. Our schools need us. Our neighbors need us. But the true secret of happiness or being blessed is not conforming to the morals or lack of morals in the world. Being in the world, we should not be of it. Jesus said this in John 15, 19. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Jesus said, if ye are of the world, if you are involved in the things of the world, the world would love you. But the world doesn't love us. As a Christian, as a born-again, Bible-believing Christian that's been set apart the world doesn't love us. My dad would always say, this world is not a friend of grace. We're not, of, we're not of the world, even though we're in the world. We're not to be of the world. While our associations will be in some part with the ungodly, we must remember that their counsel, their ways, are not the seats for us. Let me give you a, a, a prime example of that. Turn back to Genesis chapter number 13 there, if you would, just really quickly. Genesis chapter number 13, I want you to see this. We find in this chapter, Abraham and Lot, though they've been traveling together, though they've been working together, 
they found themselves in a predicament where Lot's servants and Abraham's servants were not getting along. And Abraham realized the time has come. He says in verse 18 of chapter 13, or verse 8 of chapter 13, Abraham said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right, or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lift up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves one from another. Verse number 12. And Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. We've all heard messages. We've all heard about Lot pitching his tent toward Sodom. It was just the start. He pitched his tent toward Sodom. Now, in contrast, Abraham, verse number 18, says, Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. You have in contrast, this is a perfect, perfect contrast of a blessed person versus an, a not blessed person. Lot pitched his tent to the world. Lot pitched his tent to the things that, again, to borrow the, the, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, the things that look good, the things that, he thought would make him prosperous. And then on the other hand, you have Abram. And what does he do? He goes and builds an altar to the Lord. Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. Look over in Genesis chapter number 14, verse number 12. We read, And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who, what's the next word there? Dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. So first we see Lot pitching his tent toward Sodom. He's looking at it. He's got got the front zipper pouch open, and he's looking out his tent, and what does he see in front of him? He sees the, the, the beautiful city of Sodom, the beautiful plain that's laid out in front of him, green, lush, trees growing everywhere, and the, the city of Sodom right in front of him. Next time we see him, we find him, he's living in Sodom. He's upgraded. He's moved out of his tent. Now he's living in the city. And then turn over to Genesis chapter 19, verse number 1. And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Now in, in Bible times, the gate is where the rulers of the city would sit. That's where, that's where the, the counselors and the wise men and all the, all, the, all the minds of the city would sit and they would discuss the business of the city right there in the gate. So we see Lot, he's gone from just pitching his tent looking at Sodom to living in the city of Sodom to now he's sitting with the rulers of Sodom at the gate. There's a progression. If you turn back to Psalm chapter 1, we see that same progression. Walking in the counsel of the ungodly. Standing in the way of sinners. And then sitting in the seat of the scornful. The character of the blessed person, they distance themselves from worldly counsel. But verse 2 tells us this, that they delight in God's word. The blessed person will delight in the law of God, in God's word. I'll get my notes together the next page. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. I I take two things away from this. The first one is reading. Reading God's word. Have you ever just sat down and picked up and read Psalm 119? Every verse in that psalm 
talks about God's word. Every single verse. And I didn't look it up. I can't remember off the top of my head. But there's a lot of verses in Psalm 119. Longest chapter in the Bible. David said, delight in the law. Delight is pleasure or desire. And it goes even a step further. It's desire in a valuable thing. How many of you would agree God's word is valuable? If we didn't have God's word, what would we have? We talk to God through prayer. God talks to us through his word. Conversation. Psalm 119 verse 9 says this, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? The answer, by taking heed thereto according to thy word. There's a story about an old man who lived on a farm in the mountains of eastern Kentucky with his young grandson. Each morning, Grandpa was up early, sitting in the kitchen table, reading from his old, worn Bible. And his grandson, who wanted to be just like him, tried to imitate him any way he could. One day, the grandson asked, Papa, I try to read the Bible just like you, but no matter how hard I try, I I don't understand it. And what I do understand, I forget as soon as I close the book. What good does reading the Bible do? The grandfather quietly turned from putting coal in the stove and said, take this coal basket down to the river and bring back a basket of water. The boy did as he told. However, by the time he got back to the house, all the water had leaked out of the basket. The grandfather laughed and said, you'll have to move a little faster next time and sent the boy back to the river with the basket to try again. This time, the boy ran faster. But again, the basket was empty before he reached the house. Out of breath, he told his grandfather that it was impossible to carry water in a basket and that he would get a bucket instead. The old man replied, I don't want a bucket. I want a basket of water. You can do this. You're just not trying hard enough. And he went out the door to watch the boy try again. At this point, the boy knew it was impossible But he wanted to show his grandfather that even if he ran as fast as he could, the water would leak out before he got very far. The boy scooped the water and ran hard, but when he reached his grandfather, the basket was again empty. Out of breath, he said, see, Papa, it's useless. Do you think it's useless? The old man asked. Look at the basket. The boy looked at the basket. It's clean, Grandpa. He exclaimed, it's not dirty anymore. Grandfather replied, son, that's what happens when you read the Bible. You might not understand or remember everything, but when you read it, it will change you from the inside out. How many of you would agree, when you pick up the Bible, there are some things that go right over your head? I can read a passage that I've read many times before that I thought I understood, and when I read it that time, I said, what does that mean? What is it talking about? I don't always understand. I've always said if I was stranded on an island alone, I would take my Bible, a hymn book, and a dictionary. Because the dictionary I could use to look up the words in the Bible that I don't understand. But just like that story illustrated, you're not going to understand, you're not going to remember everything you read. You're going to forget things. There's things that when I was in Bible college that I probably could tell you right off that today, it's somewhere in there, but I don't know where it is. I can't find it. I forgot which filing cabinet I put it in. And on top of that, God's Word is living. It's alive. It changes. Not the words. But it changes what it can mean to you. There's things that I read back when I was younger that didn't mean what they mean to me today. But the point is, as you read it, the continual washing of God's word over your life, you may not consciously make a change, but by reading, it allows God to change you. It is God which worketh in you to do and to will of his good pleasure. He is still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and stars. And Jupiter and Mars, how loving and patient he must be. He's still working on me. The blessed man 
delight in God's word, reading God's word. But then he goes and he says, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Meditate on God's word. Now, meditation doesn't mean you pull up a chair and you sit down. I'm not going to cross my legs because I can't. But sit there and hum, hum. That's not what the psalmist is saying. That's not the meditation that the psalmist is getting across. Meditate means to ponder or to study. We're encouraged every day to get our Bibles out and to read God's Word, whether it's a proverb, whether it's a psalm, whether it's something. You know, in our busy life, to sit down, take 10, 15 minutes, and to read God's Word. That's great. But take it one step further. Take one verse or even just one thought out of what you read and think about it. Ponder it. Don't let it go. You're not gonna you're not gonna be able to remember the entire if you read a if you read an entire chapter of Proverbs, you're not gonna remember everything that you read in that Proverbs throughout the whole day. But pick a verse, pick a thought. And the psalmist here says, meditate on it. Ponder it. Think about it. When the angel came to Mary and said, You're gonna bear God's son. What did it say she did? She pondered them in her heart. She meditated on the words that the angel told her, and she thought about it. And I believe that prepared her heart for what God was going to do with her life. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. Joshua told that the children of Israel, right after they crossed, or after he took over from Moses being the leader of the, of the children of Israel, he said, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. That sounds an awful lot like Psalm chapter 1, doesn't it? So we see the character of the blessed person. They distance themselves from worldly counsel, and they delight in God's word. The next thing I want you to see is the condition of the blessed person. What does doing all of that do for the blessed person? We see in verse number three, the Bible says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Now when you think about a tree, what are the things you normally see? You, you see the branches, you see the leaves, you know there's roots. You can't necessarily see the roots, but you know there's roots and branches and, and everything that goes in. When you think about a tree that's planted by water, you usually think of a tree that's strong and sturdy. And that's exactly what the psalmist here is saying. He's, he's a tree planted by water. I got to thinking about the tree. Did the tree put itself there? No. God put the tree there. And just like that tree is put where God wants it, you and I, if we will allow God, he will put us right where he wants us. Tazewell, Tennessee. Why Tazewell? Why Claiborne County? Why does God have you here? I've met a lot of people that have moved here from some of the strangest places, like Larry and Diane. I mean, how did you end up in Tazewell, Tennessee? God put you here for a reason. To be my neighbor and bring me red velvet cupcakes, which, by the way, are delicious. To be a blessing, to be an encouragement. God has everyone. Have you ever wondered why? Have you ever stopped as you walked into church and said, God, why am I here? What do you have for me to do here? If you haven't, I, I challenge you tonight, while, you're sitting, while I'm preaching, ask God, why am I here? What do you have me to do? There's a story in Genesis about Abram's servant that he sent away to find a wife for his son. 
How many of you are familiar with the story I'm talking about? He sent, Sarah said, I don't want my son to marry one of the women that's around here. Send him back to where we came from. Send a servant back to where he came from and find a wife there. Genesis chapter 24, verse 27, this is the servant speaking. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. And he says these five words, I being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. I've always wanted to preach a message about being in the way. You know, a lot of times we say, you're just in the way. Get out of the way. You're just in the way. This servant, when he was in the way, God led him. God will put you, just like he planted that tree by the water, God will put you right where he wants you. It's the condition of a person. They're like a tree. The next thing is they bear fruit. They bear fruit. We find in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 through 20, Beware of false prophets which come to you. These are the words of Jesus saying these. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth good fruit, that bringeth not forth good fruit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, verse 20 says, wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. You heard the phrase, no fruit, no root. How do you know that someone's a Christian? How do you know that someone is a born-again believer? By their fruit. What fruit do we, are we talking about? Well, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, Paul tells us, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against such there is no law. Now notice, Paul didn't say the fruits, plural, of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. It's all rolled up in one thing. The fruit of the Spirit. And I like at the end, he says, against such there is no law. Have you ever heard of a law against joy? You can't be happy. A law against goodness. There is no law against the fruit of the Spirit. Paul also said in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 9, he summed all of those things up into three things. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. It's the condition of a blessed person. They're like a tree. They bear fruit. And then we also see in this verse, whatsoever he doeth, shall prosper. We read in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, Joshua said, The law shall not depart out of thy mouth, meditate day and night, observe to do all according that is written therein. And he said, For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Now let me be careful to point out, this is not the success of the world. The world measures success in wealth, in popularity, in, in all the, the material things. God promises us prosperity and success in things that are beyond this world. Things that matter. Jesus said, lay not up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust do corrupt, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven Thieves don't break in and steal it there. It doesn't corrupt. It doesn't rust. It doesn't wear away. Heavenly, eternal treasure. That's where our success is measured in. I like to tell people that my retirement is out of this world. 
out of this world. I plan on serving Jesus till the day I die. In my retirement, when I'm done, it's because I'm out of this world. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So we see the character of the blessed person. We see the condition of a blessed person. And I don't just really quickly, the comparison of a blessed person. Psalms and even the book of Proverbs. And it was, it, it's, it's because the Jewish mind, the way they think, they compare things. They, they give you one side and then they give you the other side. You see that in Proverbs. It talks about the wise man and then talks about the foolish man, the, the wise person and the foolish person. So here in the last three verses, he compares what we just talked about, about a blessed man, with the way of the ungodly. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. So the way of the ungodly, they're driven like the chaff. The chaff is the outer shell of wheat. And when they would harvest the wheat, what they would do is they would take the grains, they'd dry them out in the sun, then they'd come and they would beat them with a lot of times with a stick or something something heavy, they would beat them. You, we find um, Gideon, when the angel first appeared to him, where was he? He was threshing wheat. He was, he was taking that wheat that had sat out and dried in the sun, and he was, beat, he was separating the wheat kernel from, from the chaff. And then what they would do is they would take those and lay them out on, on a flat sheet, and then several people would get around it, and they would take it, and they would throw it up in the air. Usually on a windy day, the wind would come along, and it would blow that chaff away, and the wheat would drop back down to the blanket. And then they would take that, and they would grind it, and they would make their, their meal or their flour to make bread. David took a picture of something that everybody of his day understood. He says the ungodly are like the chaff, that unwanted portion that's just blown away. They don't, they don't last. There's no substance there. They're going to be carried away. They're driven like the chaff. We see in verse number 5, they shall not stand in the judgment. Now what's he talking about? There are two times that men are going to be judged. The first time is at the judgment seat of Christ. That's when we as Christians will stand before God and we'll give account for what we've done, whether it's good or whether it's bad. This is also when we will receive the crowns for what we've done, the crowns that we will then turn and cast back at Jesus' feet, for he alone is worthy. This will be a time of sorrow because we know we could have done more. But also a time of rejoicing because we'll be with Christ forever. God says he'll wipe away the tears from our eyes. That's the first judgment. Then there's a second judgment. That's called the great white throne judgment. This is when the rest of the world at the end of time will stand before God and be judged for their rejection of Jesus as their Savior. This is when the words, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, will be spoken. It's when God will look men in the eyes and say, I never knew you. And they'll be cast in the lake of fire. The ungodly will not stand at the judgment seat of Christ. They will not stand when we receive our crowns. They will not stand when we are ushered into heaven to be with Christ forever but they will stand at the great white throne judgment. At that time, the Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, but it will be too late. It will be too late. God will look at him and say, I never knew you. Depart. It's the way of the ungodly. They're driven like the chaff. That can also go, go in line with the way they make their decisions. They're tossed to and fro. They're carried about by every wind of thought, by every wind of, of the world that, that they follow. My dad always says, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. 
They're driven like the chaff. They will not stand the judgment seat of Christ. We have that in comparison or in contrast to the way of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. What is the way of the righteous? Psalm 37 verse 23 says this, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Do you want to be blessed? Do you want God's blessing on your life? Distance yourself from worldly counsel and delight yourself in God's word. If you do that, God will prosper you. God will bless you. And I'm not, again, I'm not talking, I don't, this isn't prosperity gospel, this isn't prosperity preaching. This prosperity, this is God's blessing in your life. And no amount of worldly success or worldly riches or worldly material can ever compare to that. Application is simply this. God's blessing in our life is directly associated to our delight in his word. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Let's all desire, let's all delight in God's law, and let's all be blessed, blessed people. Let's pray. Lord, I do thank you.